So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to this webinar offered by the European uh, School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's platform uh, for school education in Europe. My name is Maria Lena, and I will be your host uh, for today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to find the recording uh, from next week onwards on the European School Education Platform or our YouTube channel. Uh, so, moreover, towards uh, the end of this session, we will share with you, me or my colleague Marta, uh, who will join us in a few minutes. Uh, we will share with you a short evaluation form. So please dedicate uh, three to five minutes uh, after the webinar in order to fill it in, uh, since your feedback is very important for us. So for today's webinar on the topic of uh, cyberbullying, we have invited Gareth Cott, uh, uh, who uh, you are able to see. Uh, who has a strong expertise on the field of online safety and digital citizenship as well. So, uh, Gareth, besides being part uh, of our team uh, of digital citizenship at the European Schoolnet, he also provides regular, regular uh, consultancy services uh, for the UK Safer Internet Centre. And he also works uh, for schools and other educational uh, settings uh, with youth, parents or carers, educators, uh, and he helps them basically to build awareness and skills around online safety, positive and healthy use of technology, and of course, digital citizenship. And today with uh, Gareth, we will uh, discuss and unfold the phenomenon of cyberbullying, uh, but uh, we will also explore some strategies that will help us prevent and uh, respond to it uh, with the support of social and emotional learning. Of course, if you're interested in participating in more webinars, uh, stay with us towards the end of this session to learn more about the upcoming learning events on uh, the European School Education Platform. Once again, thank you for being here. And uh, with no further delays, uh, Gareth, the floor is yours. You can also share your screen. Thank you, Maria Elena. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for, for giving some time on a Friday afternoon to, to join us. It's, Greatly appreciated. Uh, let me just share my screen quickly and we'll get the slides up. There we go. So hopefully you can now see my presentation and I do have two screens set up, so I should still be able to see you all in the chat as well. So welcome. My name is Gareth Court. As you heard, I'm a, a member of the digital citizenship team at European Schoolnet. I'm based in the UK, but, but regularly over with my colleagues in Brussels, where European Schoolnet are located. And as Mary Elena did very well in introducing me, um, I work across online safety and digital citizenship, both in the UK and across Europe as well, working in schools, working on various projects and resources and, uh, and other things that can help empower educators like you to support children and young people to be safe, positive and responsible digital citizens. So we're going to turn our attention today in this webinar to a, uh, a really important and in fact very persistent topic and area of, of online risk, this idea of cyberbullying or online bullying. Um, and you'll see as we go through this presentation how this has been uh, quite a persistent one for a number of years online. Uh, and it's one that definitely isn't going away. So it is about understanding it fully uh, to help uh, support your students if it happens to them, but also explore ways of tackling it from a proactive stance to try and avoid these situations in the first place. You'll notice on the first slide that there is a QR code. If you have a smartphone or tablet or device with a camera handy and you want to quickly scan that, that will give you quick access to all the slides that I will be presenting from today. There's also a short link just below that and uh, we will pop that into the chat uh, in a few moments. And you can use that to access these slides at any time after today's session. So all the things that I'm going to show you in these slides will be available to you. Anything in the slides when you're navigating through them that is underlined, just like the, the hyperlink that you can see on the front slide here, you can click on that and that will open a new browser window and take you to that particular resource. So there's lots of extra things that you can explore out of these slides as well. Uh, my contact details are also provided at the end. So if you do wish to email me after today's session with any questions, please do feel free. I'm happy to help. And to, please do feel free to, to put any questions into the chat as we go through the session. And I'll do my best to pay attention to, uh, to the chat while I'm going through slides and answer those either as we go or at the end. There are a couple of activities 
in this presentation that I would like you to take part in. So please do take part if you can, and I will give you instructions when we get to those activities. So don't worry. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, whoops. Let's uh, consider what we're going to be covering in today's session. We're going to be thinking about the different forms that online bullying can take and why it is important to understand the, the nature of cyberbullying in order to be able to understand, prevent or respond to it. We're going to consider ways that not only young people, but us as educators and indeed online users ourselves can all positively respond to uh, inappropriate uh, or unacceptable behaviour online, be it bullying, be it hate speech or, or other forms of abusive uh, behaviour. And I'm going to signpost you at the end to some really useful places where you can get help and support and further advice if you need it in your country as well. So a really important place to start actually is to, to get your thoughts and your ideas. Before I talk about cyberbullying and the nature of it, I, I wanted to, uh, to gauge what your opinions and your thoughts are on this issue. So what I would like you to do, first of all, is to head over or either on the device that you're accessing this presentation, this uh, webinar on or on a separate device, if you so wish, like a smartphone. I'd like you to head over to www.menti.com and then you need to enter the code that is pictured on the slide 5489. 8978. And then on your device, it will give you um, a, a list of text boxes where you can enter as many different ways that you can think of, of how someone may mistreat or bully or display hateful behavior to someone else online. Now, I appreciate this is a, a sensitive activity. You are welcome to take this as far as you wish. For some people, this, this may be something that's quite personal or quite sensitive, so I'm not going to force anyone to respond. Please do put as many answers as the, you wish to put into the text boxes. It will create a giant word cloud of everyone's ideas. And I'd also like you, if you if you feel comfortable with it, I'd like you to be quite creative. Imagine there are there are no restrictions. How could someone mistreat someone else online if there were no restrictions, no no barriers? What's the most creative way that they might be able to do that? So I'll give you a few moments. And while you're doing that, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to swap my sharing of my screen. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and we're going to share the Mentimeter where we will see the word cloud start to develop. Don't worry if you haven't captured any of these details on screen or in the chat, because how to join the mentee will also be displayed on the word cloud in a moment. So don't worry if you miss these details. So hopefully you should now be able to see. Our word cloud and we'll just give people a few moments to respond and enter some ideas and this will update in real time. OK, so I'll just talk over them as the results uh, come in. I can see eight people have submitted some answers. Sorry, 10 people so far. Thank you so much. And we can see we've got a mixture of behaviours, but we've also got certain platforms in which this behaviour may happen. So things such as threads uh, and Instagram. We've got behaviours such as sharing other people's personal or sensitive data and information, spreading rumours, use of insults, use of bad language or rude words posting of indecent images of other people. Um, what else have we got? Keeps moving around, so I have to keep, <laughs> have to keep, uh, keep up with it. Um, I think that's most of the ones. Spreading, spreading actual lies, so not just rumours, but actually spreading disinformation about other people as well. Tagging things with, with different terms or nicknames, using uh, rude language or dirty language as well. OK, and you'll notice that the larger words in the word cloud are, are terms where people have actually used the same word in their response. And you can see that insult has actually come out larger than some of the others, as has things such as private photos and indeed uh, more extreme behaviours such as harassment and stalking that you can see on there has also come up very large as well. So we'll just give people a few more moments just to add a few other ones. And then we'll talk about the uh, the even wider nature of these behaviours as well. So I can see also amongst posting uh, intimate images, there's also posting fake 
photos of people. They could be photoshopped. They could be AI generated. They could be um, cropped or manipulated in some way. There's comments there about uh, body shaming about people in images. That's that's also a common occurrence as well. OK, and I can also see mention in there of things such as sexism and racist behavior and racist terms as well. So it shows that uh, immediately just from the responses that you've entered in there, a, a very broad range of different behaviors that can fall under what we call or consider to be bullying. And that is part of the the difficulty sometimes with bullying is that there is a wide range of different behaviors that can be displayed and any one bullying situation can be very, very different to another bullying situation, depending on the individual young people that are involved, their their ages, their their preference of different games and platforms and apps that they might choose to use to communicate their relationships with other people, their particular characteristics. So it could be protected characteristics like their gender, like the color of their skin or their ethnicity, uh, like other characteristics such as um, additional educational needs or disabilities. All of these kind of things can factor into to the nature of the bullying as well. So it looks like our word cloud has settled down. Thank you so much for contributing to that. What I will do after this session is I will take a screenshot of the word cloud and I will drop it in onto uh, where we are in the slides so that you can actually see all of these in the future if you wish to as well. But thank you so much for, for joining that word cloud. I'm going to stop sharing and head back to the presentation slides. Bear with me just a moment. There we go. So you did a really good job there. Thank you for, for covering a wide range of different behaviours that can uh, take place and fall under this idea of bullying. And I'm just going to show you um, a, a very sort of broad range of other behaviours that haven't actually been considered there in our discussion. So, whoops, sorry. There we go. Um, so we did mention a number of these. We talked about things such as um, sharing indecent or personal or private images of people, but indeed the fact that those images can be manipulated, they may be edited or photoshopped or AI generated, and that can apply not just to photos, that can apply to videos, that can apply to live stream content. It can apply to audio content as well. So, so don't forget, abusive behaviour doesn't have to always take the form of words. It could be abusive uh, phone calls or voicemail messages on smartphones. It could be uh, abusive audio messages sent through platforms like WhatsApp and other uh, messaging platforms like Discord. It can involve impersonation, which I, I don't think is one that we mentioned here. But the fact that actually, if you wanted to, to really harm someone, you could do so by befriending them online, being really nice to them, learning their, their insecurities, their vulnerabilities, the things that they, they're anxious or worried about and then turning and using those kind of things against them and, and publicly shaming them or, or publicly sharing their secrets or their sensitive information. Likewise, you can also impersonate someone to get them in trouble. So, you know, if there's someone who, who always follows the rules and is always kind and always positive, you might try to damage their reputation by pretending to be them in an online game or a social media platform and behaving in ways and saying and doing things that they would never do in order to try and get them in trouble in some way in the offline world. And we see that behavior a lot of young people too. There's also the fact that it, there is a difference uh, and a different dynamic of this as to whether or not the communication and this abuse is happening in a public arena online. So say, for example, putting nasty comments under someone's YouTube video or comments on Instagram or other social media where other users are able to see those comments and interact with them. And for some bullies, that is the preferred method of oper operating because they know that actually if they put a nasty comment about someone, um, underneath their YouTube videos or on social media, other people are going to think the same thing and join in. And that's going to compound the bullying. It's going to make the problem much, much bigger very quickly. Similarly, though, there there's sometimes merit, if you like, for bullies to to adopt a very private approach or one on one messaging approach with the person that they want to target. That can sometimes be just as effective. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even need to be particularly offensive in nature. It can just be the persistence of sending direct personal messages to someone. Imagine if someone sent you a message on social media or through a messaging app uh, and they sent it to you right now at this time of day today and they said, I'm watching you. And then tomorrow at the same time of day, they send you another message saying, I'm watching you. And then on Sunday, they send you another message at the same time saying, I'm watching you. How many days until you start to feel a little bit anxious or insecure? 
probably not many for most of us. And it shows, you, you know, sometimes passive aggressive behaviours come out where they're not overtly rude or using bad language or using any hateful terms, but it's the nature of the communication, sometimes the persistent, ongoing, repeated nature that can be just as harassing and upsetting as something that's really, really offensive in terms of language. Um, for young people particularly, we, we often see the, the one down at the bottom left, this whole idea of exclusion, of leaving other young people out of online spaces and groups. And that can be a very effective way of, of putting distancing someone, making them feel very alone and affecting their emotions in a negative way. Saying things like, you can't be in my WhatsApp group, I'm going to kick you out. You can't be in our gaming clan. You need to go and find another one. All of those kind of things can can actually have a huge impact. And then, as you rightly pointed out in the word cloud, a number of you, there are slightly stronger forms in terms of things such as harassment and stalking behaviours that can spill into the offline world as well as the online world. And that's the interesting thing is that uh, with many online bullying incidents that involve young people, as we'll see a little bit later on, it actually involves someone known to them in the offline world. It's not a complete random stranger chucking loads of abuse and hate at them online. That does happen, but it's rare. It's more often than not someone that actually knows them and knows what makes them tick and what makes them vulnerable and what makes them uncomfortable. And it's someone who chooses to prey on that uh, to, to make them feel in that way. So thank you for taking part in that activity. I appreciate it. for some of you that may have felt like quite a sensitive and difficult thing to do. And it is a difficult thing to do you know, for, for most of us, be you child or adult. We don't sit around you know, dreaming up ways of mistreating other people. It's not something that we naturally do as human beings. And um, it's important to recognise that, that the reason for doing this isn't to create uh, a master group of, of bullying experts. Now that we've thought of all these different ways, of course, it's not acceptable to now go off online and start doing all of those things and mistreating other people. That That is totally unacceptable. But actually, by talking about and exploring these many different forms that bullying can take, we can create a greater awareness of being able to spot when it is happening to others online. Because the reality is, is that if you're being bullied or if a young person is being bullied online, you tend to know about it because bullying makes you feel a certain way. It makes you feel very upset. It makes you feel worried. It can make you feel angry. It produces certain emotions. That's how we know we're being bullied. But when someone else is being bullied online, it's not always immediately obvious. As you can see from all these different forms of behaviour, some of these are quite nuanced. Some of these are done in private rather than public. And it's not always easy to tell online, particularly through social media and messages, as to what the other person on the receiving end is, is thinking or feeling. So the more that we can do to empower our students to understand the many forms that this can take, the more we can equip them with the strategies to spot when this is happening online to other people and to try and take some action to help deal with that situation and support the person who is on the receiving end of this kind of abuse. And um, I'll explain why that's important in a couple of minutes when we get to it in the slides. Um, I'm just going to add a few more forms to that. I think we've covered most of them actually in that word cloud and, the, and that graphic that I just showed you. But these are taken from the Kid Actions Project that European Schoolnet was part of um, between tw late 2020 and 2022. And um, it, some desk based research that happened in that project highlighted even more forms of bullying that can exist online. So I won't go through all of these because we've, we've covered some of these already, but just to, to highlight a few things. There is the fact that, as I mentioned, although rare, sometimes it is random strangers that hurl abuse and are hateful to others online. And that's what we tend to call trolling. Um, but there is things such as cyber stalking, there's cyber persecution. There's this whole idea of, of griefing where you're actually harassing someone in a virtual world, such as an online game, be it Roblox or Fortnite or a virtual world on a VR headset, actually getting up and invading their personal space or following, following them around in this virtual environment or displaying other behaviours that if you did so in the offline world would be considered harassment uh, or, um, you know, actually sort of upsetting someone. There are things such as, I hate the term at the top, I'm sorry, fraping, which is a, short for Facebook raping, but this whole idea of actually hacking into or gaining access to someone else's account to change details on their profile or their status to, to damage their reputation or to upset them in some kind of way. There's things such as catfishing, which you've probably heard about in terms of online grooming, usually where um, adult predators are, are trying to uh, manipulate and coerce children into something that involves uh, harming them in some way. 
And you may have heard lots of news media stories about how adults will pretend to be children online in order to groom other children. The reality of that is a little bit more complicated, actually. Not many adults do pretend to be children. They, they actually tend to be adults and lie about their age. But this whole idea of catfishing and, and hiding your true identity to be someone else online is a weapon that could be used by bullies as well. You, a number of you mentioned this in the word cloud, this whole idea of outing, sometimes known as doxing, where you share someone else's personal information or sensitive information because you know it's going to harm them in some way if you share it. It could be details such as their phone number or their email address or their passwords because you know that other people are going to exploit that information or it could be sharing details about their, their mental health or a medical condition or, or other sensitive details that you know are going to cause upset if lots and lots of people get to hear about it. And then, of course, as a number of you also mentioned, things such as sexting can, can also be used. So non-consensual intimate image abuse may be used as a form of bullying and indeed threatening behaviour as well. So making death threats or threats of violence to someone can all feature into this behaviour too. So a very, very wide range of, uh, of very negative behaviours that can affect people in different ways. So who does it affect and what's the impact? So I'm just going to show you uh, a few different research studies from uh, across different parts of the world um, and across a number of years recently that just help paint a clearer picture about the nature and the prevalence of cyberbullying. First place to start, uh, and sorry, I am going to draw on a couple of UK based sources of information mainly because they are the most up-to-date that I can find. I'm struggling to find EU-wide data that, that's as up-to-date as, as this. But I think that the, the general themes that come out of these UK reports can be applied to many of your countries as well. The, the exact numbers might be a little bit different, but I think the general themes are, are largely transferable. So this is from uh, Internet Matters, who are an organisation in the UK who provide online safety guidance and advice for parents and carers and families. And they've been running a digital well well-being index in the UK for a couple of years now where they have been asking families and parents and children about their online experiences and about the nature of those experiences, the good and the bad. And their latest digital index report for 2024 highlights the different risks that young people in the UK have said that they have experienced online. And the light blue bar that you'll see on this is the most recent statistics for 2023. And you'll notice if you look down the chart that um, bullying sits at number four. So it is a significant issue. And I will show you some other research in a moment that backs that up. It, it is not a small issue. It is an issue that affects a number of young people, but it is not the top issue that most young people face online. And you'll see that this massive difference of the bar up here of seeing things online that aren't true. So misinformation, disinformation, fake news, other types of things that are going to change people's views and perceptions. That is one of the most common risks that young people face online. Then it is people you don't know, strangers trying to contact you. Then it is seeing extreme content such as violent content. And then it is bullying. So bullying is a significant issue, but it isn't the top issue. And, and it does highlight it needs to be taken in the context of other risks that affect young people online. It is an important one to acknowledge. It is definitely an important one to tackle and to give students strategies to deal with. But we need to recognise that it is just one of a number of different risks online. And it isn't always the one that is the most common to young people. So it's important to keep that context around it when you're teaching your students. And um, just to highlight one example where we have seen it being the top issue. So we uh, coordinate the InSafe network of safer Internet centres, 29 safer Internet centres spread across the European Union and wider Europe. And uh, each safer Internet centre has an awareness raising centre. They have a helpline for reporting various online issues and they have a hotline for reporting child sexual abuse material. So the stats that you see on the screen are from the helplines that are run across the, uh, the network in the 29 countries. And every quarter we collect together the data as to the reasons why um, individuals in society contacted that helpline in their country. Some helplines in some countries are for teachers, some helplines are for families, in other countries, the helplines are actually for, for children and young people themselves. So there's a bit of a mixture in here, but you'll notice one consistency across the, the data that we have for 2023. And that is that the, the highest reason for contacting any of those helplines has been cyberbullying. So it is definitely an issue that is a persistent one, as I mentioned, but is one that affects a lot of young people because it is either children themselves contacting the helpline and saying that cyberbullying is an issue, or it may be families saying that it's an issue with their children, or it is teachers and educators contacting the helpline and saying 
this problem is happening in my school with my students. So, so that's one example of where we, we definitely know that cyberbullying is a prominent issue. We see it all the time through the helpline contact that we receive. And this data isn't exclusive for 2023. We've had data like this going back a number of years now. Cyberbullying always sits at the top of the reasons for contacting the helplines. So, so that's important to keep in mind and uh, as part of this picture as well. Another important part is to show the variability, the difference, depending on where you look and how you ask the questions about online bullying. So this was a meta analysis conducted um, across research studies in European Union countries in 2022, looking at uh, data across studies over a number of years. And across this meta analysis, they were looking at studies where they were looking at the rate of young people reporting that they had been cyber bullied, so cyber victimization looking at the rates of young people admitting that they had actually been a bully online, cyber perpetration, and looking at the rates of young people who had said that they had witnessed or observed bullying happening online in some way, being a cyber bystander. And you can see there's a massive range in the numbers here under these different categories. Cyber victimization ranges from 2.8% to 31.5%, depending on which study you look at. And different studies have different sample sizes, different methodology, different ages of young people involved, different types of questions that have been asked. But it does show there's a very, very wide range there in terms of the reporting. It could be as low as under 3%, all the way up to almost a third of young people saying that they have been bullied online. Similar for, for cyber perpetration, for those young people admitting that they have actually bullied others, there's a massive range there as well, from 3% to 30%. Um, so depending on which study you look at and the nature of the study, the, the rate of cyberbullying can vary dramatically. Um, even though it has a big range, the last area, cyber bystander, is, is actually, I think, one to focus attention on to highlight that, yes, it could be as low as 13 percent, but it could be as high as half of your students saying that they have actually seen bullying behaviour happening online. And that's sometimes the area to focus some of our attention on. Yes, we want to support victims when it happens to them. Yes, we want to challenge and deal with perpetrators when they do bully others online. But actually, for a large amount of your students, they may not be a victim or a perpetrator, but they may be seeing this behaviour happening to others. And sometimes focusing attention on how to equip those students with the skills and the strategies to do something positive in those situations is really important. They're not involved in it directly. It's not happening to them. They're not being bullied. They're not the person doing the bullying, but yet they see it happening. And in many cases, they want to do something to step in. They want to be an upstander, but they don't always have the skills or the understanding to do so. So focusing on that area is really crucial as well. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in the webinar. And then this uh, some fairly recent data as well. This actually came out in a report earlier this year from uh, the World Health, World Health Organization, who are running an ongoing health behavior and school aged children study across 44 countries, including many uh, European countries. And they have noticed an increase in the uh, number of boys and girls who have said that they are being bullied, but also the number of boys and girls who have admitted to actually bullying others. And you can see from the statistics here um, for, for boys, it's 14% who have actually admitted bullying others online and 15% who have admit, admitted being bullied. And for girls, slightly lower in terms of admitting that they've bullied others at 9%, but a very similar level to boys in terms of having been bullied online. So another important difference to highlight there is, is, is gender. Why it looks like in terms of being bullied, it's largely equal across the two genders. There's definitely a difference in terms of uh, young people actually saying whether or not they've bullied others online. And that's an important factor to keep in mind as well. And there's a link to the study on the slide there if you want to explore it further. Um, I am going to use another UK study, I'm afraid, just to highlight a couple of really important points that I think are also relevant to many other EU countries. This is actually from a, a UK charity called Ditch the Label, an anti-bullying charity based in the UK. They used to run a fantastic survey uh, that was very interesting and, and sometimes quite worrying called the Annual Bullying Survey, and, and they stopped in 2020, or technically 2021, um, largely, I think, due to the pandemic. And they, they've never brought this study back again. Their research has taken them in a different direction. So although these statistics are a little bit older, they are quite useful to draw from just to establish some, some other key characteristics about the nature of bullying and the prevalence of it, regardless of whether it's in the UK or elsewhere in the world. 
Um, first one is just to highlight what I've said in these other areas in terms of the types of bullying and the level of prevalence. In this study, cyberbullying came out at 27%. So that's very much in line with that meta-analysis that I showed you a few moments ago. But um, this is a really interesting statistic from their 2019 report. So not the 2021, the, the year before. They didn't ask this in 2020, which is a real shame. Um, but I think this is a really useful statistic to keep in mind, is that when they asked young people who bullied you, online or offline, the, the answer that came out with the biggest response was a classmate. And then the next one down was somebody at my school I don't actually know personally, or a former friend, or an enemy, or even a close friend. And you notice um, it drops right down to 10% here of not knowing who the bully is, or only someone that they've ever met or chatted to online. More often than not, it's someone known to them in the offline world. And I think that's really important in terms of your teaching and helping young people to get to grips with, is that it, it is very rarely random strangers who are coming and bullying you online. It is people closer to you who know you in some way. Either you go to the same school or you're in the same classes, or, or they have some kind of other link to you in your local community. More often than not, that is the person who's actually behind the bullying. But for young people, it can be very, very difficult because when you are online, you can't actually see necessarily who is bullying you. It's very, very hard to understand who it is. They may use a different username. They may not share a real profile picture. They may use an avatar in an online game. You can't always establish their true identity. However, when you do actually explore it in more detail, more often than not, it tends to be someone that's known to you. So that's an important thing to keep in mind too. Also important from this study was uh, the impact of this on young people in terms of their mental health, well-being and safety. And you can see from these statistics that a large number of them said that it made them feel anxious. Uh, over a third said that it led to depression. Uh, a third said it led to, to suicidal ideation, so suicidal thoughts. Over a quarter said that it led to them self-harming in some way. As you can see from these other statistics here, it led to other harmful behaviours, either not wanting to go to school, other antisocial behaviours, other self-harm behaviours like eating disorder, even attempted suicide, but also le uh, leading to other harmful behaviours around substances or indeed risky sexual behaviour as well. So there is a very real impact of this behaviour on young people, whether it's happening to them online or offline, it's designed to really damage mental health and well-being. And that is also highlighted by um, this, this quite worrying statistic actually from the report, where they asked young people what impact they felt that being bullied had had on their mental health. And you can see there's a very large bar at the top here for extreme impact. But actually the one that concerned me the most was the bar down the bottom, which was young people saying they felt that actually, yes, they'd been bullied online, but it hadn't impacted on their mental health at all. They were basically saying, yeah, it happened. It's no big, no big deal. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. That's the thing that worries me the most, because bullying is a form of abuse and an abuse takes its toll on mental health and well-being. It has an impact. So for such a large number of young people to say, yeah, it didn't matter. Don't worry about it. Forget about it is something that's quite concerning because that that raises questions about whether or not they fully understood what has actually happened to them whether they have treated it maybe all as a joke when actually something far more serious is going on or whether they're in some kind of even so post-traumatic stress in some way and they haven't fully acknowledged the impact of what's happening and it might be that a little bit later on four months six months a year the full nature and the full impact of this on their well-being actually comes out and and emerges in in certain ways so it's an important thing to, to think about if you know that some of your students have been bullied and you talk to them about their experiences and they go yeah don't worry about it it doesn't matter those are actually some of the students i would be most worried about in terms of their mental health because i don't think they fully consolidated and understood the nature of, of what's happened to them so something to keep in mind as well and I won't read these out, but they're, they're here in the slides for you. These are um, quotes from young people in the UK who have experienced bullying, both online and offline, highlighting the lasting impact that it has had on their mental health and their well-being and their, their identity in some cases as well. We've got examples here of um, suffering anxiety and depression. We've got examples of um, young people feeling they need to change their appearance because they've been body shamed or they've been called out on their appearance in certain ways by bullies. They've got those who have had friendship groups destroyed or split up because of rumours and gossip behind their back. And uh, just one quote down the bottom here, a young, young man who actually had language weaponised against him. So had been called gay because he likes dancing 
which is a very sad thing is, that, is to feel that we can still use language around um, sexual orientation and, and gender identity as weapons against people. But in bullying behaviour, sometimes there are no holds barred and, and people do use this language in this way. And it can have a lasting impact on people's identity and sense of self-worth as well. So it just highlights the impact that this can have. So that sounds rather depressing, sort of seeing that all in one go. And, and it is a significant issue, as you've seen from the statistics. Let's turn our attention to how we can actually positively tackle this behaviour. And there's a number of different approaches that we can take. I'm going to start with the, the most standard, if you like. So the, the common type of advice that I would give out to parents and carers and I would give out to, to young people themselves. And then we'll move on to some slightly more nuanced methods that you can employ in and out of the classroom to help support your students. So for parents and carers, um, commonly when we're talking about this area, I would give them advice around recognising that even if they don't understand the online world and they don't understand the apps and the games that their children use, they can still play an important positive role in supporting them if their child is being bullied or sees bullying happening online. But the first thing to understand in that area is to understand the nature of technology immediately and actually to understand that, yes, you want to protect your child, and yes, of course, if your child is being bullied on Fortnite, it's going to feel really tempting to take away their PlayStation. And yes, if they're being bullied on TikTok, it's going to feel really tempting to take away their smartphone because that might seem like a really straightforward solution to stop a bully from contacting your child anymore. And while yes, taking away someone's, uh, someone's Xbox or PlayStation if they're being bullied on a game will stop the bully from contacting them that way. And yes, taking away their smartphone will stop them from being bullied on social media it doesn't actually tackle the root cause of the problem. And of course, a, a very persistent bully may find other ways of contacting a child on another device or another app or another game. So it's really important for parents to understand that actually taking away the tech doesn't stop the bullying. It just cuts off one way that a bully, bully may try to contact your child, but it doesn't tackle the root cause. And that's where these other, re, uh, other ways listed are really important. It's important to talk about bullying, how it happens online, just as we did at the start of this webinar, and important to talk about strategies for how you can respond to that in different circumstances. It's about exploring the tools that are available to help you on games and apps when bullying takes place. So looking for block buttons, looking for report buttons, looking for other features that can help let the game or app know when you're experiencing unacceptable behaviour. And it's about knowing where to get help offline as well. So it may be going to their child's school for advice and support if they know that other children in the school are involved in the bullying. It may be going to law enforcement like the police if they feel that laws have been broken. Now, in some uh, European countries, there are stronger laws around bullying and online bullying than there are in others. But in many countries, there are laws around um, intimate image abuse. There are laws around making death threats or threatening behaviour online and offline. Uh, many countries have laws around malicious communications or hateful communications as well. So even if the bullying isn't it isn't uh, sort of breaking the law in one sense, there may be parts of the bullying behaviour that may break other types of laws around hate speech or around uh, intimate sexual images or other other types of content as well. And police may be able to help support in those too. For children and young people, it's about you know, treating others the way we want to be treated online, showing respect and showing civility, showing kindness in many aspects as well, looking after your personal information, because if people are going to try and share it all over the place, then you need to be selective in terms of who you share that information with in the first place. And one important way of doing that is to lock down your accounts with good, strong passwords, using privacy settings to decide who you add as friends and followers on social media and how much they can learn about you on those social media profiles. It's about not responding or retaliating because, you know, that's what a bully wants. They want a reaction out of you. They want you to be angry or upset. And if you give them that reaction, they're probably going to carry on with that behaviour. If you uh, can refrain from being angry and, uh, and responding back to them, then actually that can make the situation a little bit better. It doesn't mean you should just ignore the behaviour and pretend it didn't happen. But actually fighting fire with fire, hurling abuse back at a bully, only ever makes the situation worse. Online. There are multiple opportunities to save the evidence. There are so many easy ways now to take a screenshot of something on a phone screen or to take a video capture on a computer or to take a video capture of the last 30 seconds of gameplay in an online game. And that's a great way of capturing evidence of when people do and say things that constitute bullying behaviour. And that then forms the proof or the evidence that's needed both to report it to the to the game or the app where it's happened, but also to show to someone else who may be providing help and support. 
Block and mute buttons, so actually sort of cutting people off from contacting you online are useful tools. But as I mentioned earlier, a persistent bully may just find another avenue to contact a child. So sometimes it becomes a bit like a game of whack-a-mole, you know, that game at the fairgrounds where you have to sort of hit the mole with a hammer and it pops up from various holes. Sometimes that's what bullying ends up being online. You block a bully here and they make another account and start chatting to you again, or they contact you through another method on another game or an app. So, so a persistent bully can always find a way. But the key thing really is to make sure that children and young people know that they can turn to you or another trusted adult to let you know about what's going on, seek your advice and your support and your help to tackle that situation. So it's really important to get young people to speak up and to let us know when this is happening, not just to them if it's if they're being bullied, but also when they see it happening to other people online so that we can help. But there are other strategies that can really help in this as well. And there's a really interesting study that's over on our core evidence website, which is a uh, project that's been running the last few years, collecting um, really good quality evidence around online safety and digital citizenship. And uh, I found a really interesting study there from 2021 about cyberbullying prevention programs. And again, it was an analysis of different 23 different uh, articles that looked at different school-based cyberbullying prevention programs in different countries. And they found two very interesting trends. They found that school cyberbullying initiatives that focused on e-safety and online safety were very good in terms of supporting and empowering victims of cyberbullying to get help. So if you talked about cyberbullying from an online safety perspective, it was a really good way of equipping students to know what to do if it happens to them and how to get help, how to how to kind of deal with it and respond to it. On the other hand, though, the study found that if you employ a social and emotional learning perspective to your cyberbullying prevention, what you actually do is decrease the rate of victimization and perpetration. So you actually cut it off before it ever happens. So there's two trains of thought here. So, and it's, I think it's important to have both. If you have an online safety program for tackling cyberbullying, you will give your students the tools and the strategies needed to deal with it when it does happen to them or someone they know. But if you tackle it from a social and emotional learning perspective, you can actually deal with the problem before it happens and decrease the rate of cyberbullying. So two things that are really important to consider. Uh, and that's where these two projects come in really nicely. And I, I'm delighted to say I've had the pleasure of being involved on both of these over the years. Uh, uh, both as European School Net and uh, as part of a UK charity as well. Um, and both are really good for exploring social and emotional learning to help empower young people to be safe and positive online, but also to tackle issues in particular. So the top one it may have come across is called Selma Hacking Hate. It's a toolkit for secondary educators on how to tackle hate speech online. And it explores uh, it through a lens of social and emotional learning uh, and also media literacy and citizenship education as well. I'll come back to the whole social and emotional learning side of things in a moment, but it is a great way of tackling behaviours online that may be part of bullying, but may be specifically part of hate speech or hate crimes instead. There's a bit of overlap when it comes to bullying and hate speech online. They, they share some similar characteristics, but their objectives and their motives might be quite different. Uh, but this toolkit allows you to explore it through the lens of, of dealing with hate speech. And then another one spe focused specifically on cyberbullying is the Kid Actions Toolkit, um, which has got lots of really practical resources that you can use in the classroom. Again, aimed at secondary educators, um, but both projects have resources that you could easily uh, adapt for primary school classrooms. Um, exploring uh, cyberbullying through the lens of understanding it, through preventing it and through responding to it as well. And all of that, again, through a social and emotional learning angle, which I'm just going to cover for a few moments now. So it's really important to explore social and emotional learning, not just in online safety, but I think as life skills for children and young people living in the 21st century. It has so many benefits and it can equip them with so many skills. And this is a model that's actually featured in the Kid Actions Toolkit. Um, it's the KSL model of social and emotional learning. And you can see it's got all these different rings and then this, uh, this pie chart or these five segments at the centre of these core skills of social and emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. And they are really, really important skills to develop in young people. Um, and when applied to cyberbullying are really important skills to help prevent it happening in the first place through self-awareness of emotions, self-management of behavior, through um, developing positive relationships through relationship skills, 
through recognizing the impact that your behavior has on others through social awareness, but also through, you know, having strategies that can help you deal with cyberbullying before it starts and indeed after it's happened through responsible decision making. And you can see the rings that go around on this model highlight the importance of addressing this in a number of different domains. Yes, you may well be addressing it in the classroom, but in your school, you may well have a whole school perspective about this. And I, I saw someone posted in the chat earlier about um, online safety policies or e-safety policies and helping others in your school community to understand that, such as parents and carers and students. So it is about a whole school approach sometimes to tackling these issues. We all need to be on the same page and moving in the same direction. And then, as we said, the other issues that come out of this, so helping families to understand this, helping our local community as a school to understand these issues, to all be moving in the right direction as well. But that's what social and emotional learning is about. And like all good skills, it's not something that you can just have a few lessons on and tick the box and say, yes, it's done. These are life skills. They adapt, they change, they develop. Some young people are going to reach a certain level of proficiency in these skills. Others are not. I'm sure you can think of plenty of adults uh, in, who you've met in your life who maybe haven't got proficient skills based on these five areas in the middle. You know, it varies from person to person. And uh, one of the models that's used both in the Kid Actions Toolkit and the Selma Toolkit is this model here called the Mood Meter, which is part of Yale's Center for Emotional Intelligence's ruler program. And we use this extensively in Selma and it's, it pops up a bit in Kid Actions. It's this idea of being able to develop emotional vocabulary. So this Mood Meter displays 100 different words for different emotions or feelings. And uh, the colors are significant. They help you understand the, the the whole uh, the whole structure of the model. So red and blue words are less pleasant emotions, emotions we don't really like feeling very much or for very long. Yellow and green emotions are um, more pleasant emotions, ones we do like feeling. And then from top to bottom, red and yellow emotions are high energy emotions. Blue and green uh, emotions are low energy emotions. And you might notice that if you start at the center and move out to the corners and the borders, the intensity or the strength of the emotions increases as well. And this is a really important set of skills. I'm sure it's something that, that many of you probably do in your day to day work anyway, sometimes without realizing. But trying to equip your students with the right emotional language to express how they're feeling is really important because let's face it, if it, particularly if you work with teenagers, they come into your classroom and you ask them how they are. What kind of words do you get back in response? Fine, OK, good, bleh, is often a common one, particularly with my teenage girls, they just grunt at me. Um, you know, what do those words mean? They don't mean anything. And yet there's a very rich vocabulary. And obviously this is displayed in English, but there are probably equivalent words in your language, too, for explaining and describing different emotions and different emotional states. And helping young people to develop that vocabulary is really, really beneficial. Because if you can understand it in yourself, then you can make decisions about how these emotions affect your behavior and you can take control back over your behavior. You're not ruled by your emotions. You rule over them. If you're feeling enraged, some behaviors that you feel when you're feeling really angry and enraged are going to be negative behaviors if you act, decide to act them out online or offline. You need to take control of that emotion. You need to change your emotional state so that you can decide to make behaviors and use behaviours that are going to be more positive, both to you and everyone else involved. So it's important to understand it in terms of own, your own self-regulation and uh, control of behaviours, but it also develops empathy because you can start to recognise these emotional states in other people. And being able to do that helps you recognise when someone online is feeling upset because they're, they're having hateful content thrown at them, recognising when someone's feeling angry or frustrated, re realising when someone's feeling isolated or lonely or sad. So these are really important things to develop in our students. And particularly when it comes to bullying, uh, it pro provides some great strategies then for being able to step in at the right time and say the right thing, as opposed to stepping into a situation and saying the worst thing at the worst possible time that just makes everything worse. So it, it's a really important set of skills, I think. And uh, I just wanted to highlight what it also enables. It, it, it's really important to try and find and create space to understand these emotions. And that's difficult with life online because life online is 24 seven. It's just, you know, over and over and over, constant social media posts, constant online experiences, information coming at you at all angles all the time. So sometimes you have to really work to create what's known as a meta moment, a pause to allow you to be reflective, to consider how you're feeling at that particular point in order to then move forward with the best possible version of yourself and make the best possible choices. 
I'm just going to play this very quick video from Mark Brackett from Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, just explaining this idea of the meta moment and the steps that it involves. The meta moment teaches both children and adults to prolong the space between that trigger that we all have and our reaction or our healthy response. And it's a six step process that helps kids first identify their triggers. Like what is, what is or are those things that trigger you? The second is how does that trigger affect your body and the way you think about the person or yourself in the situation? The third piece of the meta moment says, let's pause. Let's not react. Let's take that breath. Let's build that space. The fourth part of the meta moment is called your best self. And we have found in our research is that when you can teach children and adults to think about their best self, meaning I am a professor who is caring and compassion, I'm a parent who is loving and kind, that that activation of your best self helps you to choose more effective strategies to then move to step five, which is the regulation of emotion or strategizing. That instead of using negative self-talk, you use positive self-talk. Instead of blaming, you'll start reframing. Instead of yelling and screaming, you'll do problem solving. And the final step is that successful interaction in that process. So it's this process that we help people go through to really help them manage emotions more effectively and build relationships as opposed to destroy them. Sorry for the uh, the sound in the video. That was a little bit quiet, so you may have needed to turn up your volume. Um, it sounds simple, doesn't it? Really easy. That's what you have to do to create meta moments and then to be the best version of yourself online or offline. But of course it's not. It's again a difficult set of skills. It requires practice. It's going to involve mistakes. It's going to involve some experimentation. It's going to involve understanding context because what works in one situation as your best self may not work very well in a different situation. Uh, and this is all part of being human, unfortunately. Um, so I'm just conscious of time, so I'm not going to ask you to do this activity right now, although you'll feel free to do it while I continue talking and finishing up. But um, there is a link here that you can see to uh, a Padlet where you can actually um, enter onto the Padlet some ideas of what your best self would look like or do or say online. And you can have a think about what that might be. So, for example, it could be someone who thinks before they speaks or thinks before they act. It could be someone who uh, offers help to other people could be someone who uh, pays attention, keeps their eyes open to look out for when someone else might be in need. All sorts of aspects. Um, but I'm conscious of time. I don't want to run over. So it, it's there and it's available to you and it's also available in the slides for you to access as well if you want to have a go. But you can enter some things into the Padlet of what you think your best self would be like online. You know, once you've regulated your emotions, once you're in a calm state, what would the best version of you actually do? And it's a really great exercise to do with children and young people as well. You can do it by um, just taking a sheet of paper, getting them to draw an outline of a body or a self-portrait, and then actually getting them to label parts of that body with different things and different ways that they may behave uh, um, when they are being their best self. And then that's a, a template that they can kind of use the next time they go online and just think, OK, so so what would the best version of myself do if I saw my best friend you know, receiving these nasty comments? Or if my boyfriend or girlfriend has just had their nude photo shared by someone, you know, what would I do? So having those kind of strategies and exploring those what if situations are really important as well. Um, I've noticed a couple of questions in the chat. I will come back to those at the end. Don't worry, I have spotted those uh, really good questions. and I think they're probably easier to address at the end of this presentation. But um, as Mark was talking about, you know, you, being your best self also means being an upstander, actually taking some kind of action. And as we saw from the, uh, the data earlier in the webinar, the large majority of young people are bystanders in a cyberbullying situation. They're not the perpetrator, they're not the victim, but they do see it going on. So we want to empower them and mobilize them to actually do something and get involved and make a positive difference rather than doing something to make the situation worse. And this is a slide that I've been using in primary schools, but also secondary about some key tips for being an upstander when you see this kind of negative behavior going on online. The first step is to make sure that the person who is being bullied or being mistreated online knows that you are there. Don't just assume that they know you're there to help. You need to reach out to them in some way. That could be in a public way. It could be, you know, putting a comment in, in uh, underneath their video to say something really nice and say and show them that you're supporting them. Or it could be private messaging them and saying, hey, I see you're having a hard time. How can I help? What can, you know, do you want to have a chat? Should we do this? So actually showing up and making them know that they are not alone is a really important first step because bullying very much is designed to isolate someone and make them feel alone and make them feel upset and anxious. So showing them that someone is there 
and knows that they're having a difficulty and that they care is really important. It's also important to make sure that you listen and you actively listen. You don't just assume you know what that person wants to happen. They may have reasons for why they, they haven't reported a person online, or they may have reasons why they, they haven't responded or they have responded to the bully in a certain way. So you need to listen to their experiences around this and what they want to happen next. It's important not to blame them, because if you're being bullied, it's not your fault. You know, it's the other person's fault. And you mustn't assume or suggest that they ignore the behaviour. They shouldn't just say, oh, I'll just forget about it, because that doesn't solve the problem. It's important to get help from other people. Other people in the chat or the group may also care about this. They may also be really upset about the way someone's being treated, but they might not know what to do next. Or they might be scared of, of sort of coming out and saying something positive for fear that the bully turns on them. So sometimes it's about mobilising the help of other people. It's about getting other people to recognise that they can help. You might send a message to someone else and say, hey, did you see how that person's being treated? That's horrible, isn't it? We need to do something about this. What are we going to do? So there's ways that young people can mobilise other people and get that support together and rally that support. And then finally, it's about making sure you don't assume that the person being bullied knows how to protect themselves or look after themselves. Maybe they don't know how to use a block button or a report button. Maybe they've never used privacy settings before. So sometimes for young people, this can be a great way of empowering them to help others. They could teach others the skills they know about using technology that can help that protect that person again in the future. So all really positive steps as well. It's also really important for, for everyone, child or adult, to know how to report these things on the platforms and games where they occur and how to get further help as well. This is a UK based website, but it's the only place that I can find that lists quick links to the reporting portals and help centres and safety centres on all the major platforms. So this is from our report harmful content service in the UK. And this page on the site has got quick links to all the services you can see here in order to get to their safety centres and make reports. So if a young person isn't sure how to report something on a platform, you can use this as a way of learning how to make a report. So that's really, really handy. And then similarly, in your country, you've likely got the 116111 helpline and a list of the full details of them are provided on this website here. And in many countries, that helpline is reserved as a cyberbullying helpline or a helpline for children and young people to contact if they're experiencing difficulties, be it online or offline. So helping children become aware of those sources of support is really important, as well as knowing that they can turn to you for help as well. And then finally, this is a, a rather interesting one, but an important one. Sometimes it's about uh, managing your reputation online and it's about how you treat other people as well. And it's not to say that actually if you if you aren't super friendly online, you deserve to be bullied. That absolutely isn't the case. But there is a strong argument for being a positive team player in online games or supporting other people whenever you have the chance. Because what it does is it creates a perception of you online to other users that you are positive, that you are kind, that you are trustworthy. People tend to like you if you're nice to other people online, in games, on social media, in other places. It's, it's a natural human instinct. Someone's nice to us, we tend to be nice back to them. And by doing that consistently and frequently online in your behaviour, what you actually do is you build allies and you build a safety net around you. Because if someone tries to attack you online or bully you, and you've already built up this goodwill and this good feeling between you and lots of other online users, what you tend to find is that they close ranks, they rally around and they protect you because they know that you're a nice person. And so if someone tries to attack you and be mean to you, they're more likely to stand up and defend you. And that's a really powerful set of uh, skills. So actually encouraging young people to be positive, to be kind online, reaps benefits for their own safety as well as the safety of other people. So it sounds a little bit a little bit strange, but actually it, it does actually work. You know, if you treat other people really well online, you will find that they are more likely to spring to your defence if something bad happens to you. So it's another good reason for young people to show kindness and understanding wherever they can online. So uh, very quickly, some other places to get help and support. Um, our InSafe network of safer internet centres, as I mentioned, all have a helpline that we talked about earlier. And you can find details of the helplines and the hotlines and the national awareness centres for your country by going to the link that you can see on the screen here. Also, we have our Better Internet for Kids portal, which is where all those details are listed. But we also have a teacher corner full of self-directed training modules that can help you uh, skill yourself up and increase your understanding of online safety and digital citizenship. There are four key modules that you can explore 
which are the four at the top here. And then uh, regularly we are adding to a collection of deep dives on specific online safety topics. So there is one already there on cyberbullying. There's one on sexting, which can be related to bullying online. There's things such as cybersecurity and cybercrime. There's ones on hate speech, on generative AI, on uh, fake news. It's expanding all the time. So if you want to keep up to date with this general area of online safety and digital citizenship, there's lots of advice there as well. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for sticking with me for the full hour. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask after today's session, then my email address is on the screen and I'll drop it into the chat in a moment as well. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I'll turn my attention now to some of the questions that have come in. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Gareth. Sorry. Um, again, I'm experiencing some technical issues with my camera. I'm very sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for participating. If you have uh, a few minutes left, I would like to show you the upcoming learning events on the European School Education Platform. Please uh, feel free uh, to click on the links on your screens. They are clickable. You can uh, click and either register for the upcoming webinar uh, on teaching about climate change on uh, Wednesday, uh, 19th of June, or join any of our online courses. Uh, right now, there is uh, a course that opened on uh, Monday, the 20th of May, and it will be running until Wednesday, the 5th of June. So please uh, feel free to explore it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you all. I uh, wish we had some time to uh, reply to some questions. Maybe we can uh, give a few seconds. Uh, because I, I saw a very nice question. How important is documentation in cyberbullying and who can help in tracing them back to the bully? Maybe give a few seconds, a very brief concluding reply to that, Gareth. Sure, thank you. I'm, and I'm just trying to respond to some of the questions in the chat as well. So I'll, I'll try and get to those as quickly as I can. Um, yeah, evidence is absolutely key in, in cyberbullying. And sometimes people think that they can be anonymous online and they can't be traced back. I think in the large majority of cases, you can trace it back to someone, even if they are anonymous, because of the, the different ways that you can collect uh, evidence. So encouraging your students to take screenshots, to take video captures, to save chat logs, uh, to save copies of things is really one of the most effective ways. Um, tracing a user down by more technical means like IP addresses and device addresses is, is more complex. That often ends up being a matter for, for police and cyber experts to, to delve into rather than you as a school. But you find more often than not that you can get enough clues from, from screenshots and videos that have been captured by students to, to be able to sometimes figure out who has been behind the bullying and, and then take appropriate steps. So yeah, evidence is absolutely key and the more you can collect, the better. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, we can conclude uh, our webinar now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gareth, uh, once again. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, please enjoy your weekend, take some rest, and uh, see you in our upcoming uh, learning event, event on the European School Education Platform. Thank you all very much. Have a nice evening. Thanks, everyone.